Hi everybody, thanks very much for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at and around medcomsnetworking.com. So information services, activities, resources for people who work in and around medcoms, by which I mean uh, people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing. You'll find lots of resources at medcomsnetworking.com. Uh, you'll find loads of these uh, video recordings of these sorts of webinars at Network Pharma TV. Um, and if you're one of the people who wants to come into Medcoms and you're looking to find out more about Medcoms and the career opportunities, then there's a whole load of information at firstmedcomsjob.com and more websites are available. So please have a look around. Um, these webinars at the moment, these weekly webinars are great. We're getting a good size international audience and we're getting speakers from all over talking about relevant topics. Um, today, I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Dan and Mike again. Um, this is, I think this is the fourth year, isn't it? It's the fourth survey and it's the fourth year we've done a meeting like this. Um, so we're going to hear the results of the fourth um, uh, healthcare communications salary survey and so on. Um, so thanks guys for coming back again. Um, if anyone's interested, you can look back at previous webinars at Network Pharma TV and compare and contrast the data a little bit more than we'll do in this presentation. But I know that's part of what you're going to be doing in your presentation now. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dan to lead, lead his way through the presentation and share the data with us, which I think is going to be quite interesting. Thank you very much. Mike? I thought you were going to say hello, Dan. Do you want hello. to share the slides? Yes. Sorry, no, yeah, stop the slide, yeah. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Here we go. Great. So, um, yeah, this is the 2021 Healthcare Communication Salary and Insights Insight Survey. Um, as Peter said, it's the fourth year we've done this. Um, massive thank you to everybody who's who contributed and, and, and completed the survey. Without you guys, we wouldn't have this data. Um, Thank you to Peter and Mike and Manny, all the guys in the back room trying to promote um, the survey. Uh, but hopefully you'll find the results very, very interesting. Next slide, please. OK, I'm uh, Dan Clifton of Paramount Recruitment and Paramount Incorporated um, in the US. So we've got two sides of the business, the UK and US. We're a life science recruitment consultancy with 18 years in healthcare comms and we provide services across the globe. Next slide, please. So, yes, yeah, so um, we had very, very successful surveys in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Everybody seems to want to know what's going to happen in terms of the results this year, especially with the COVID situation. So we've, ha we've added a couple of new questions in there and hopefully compa compare with, with previous years, um, uh, which will hopefully make it a bit more interesting in terms of um, where we've been in the last 12 months. Uh, we, we launched it on the 20th of April, uh, and as always, it's LinkedIn, email, Paramount, Medcoms Networking, and we've had 700, 720 completed responses. Last year, I think it was, what, was it 9.30 last year, Mike? But that included US, that included the US. This is purely UK. The survey is purely UK. Um, we have got a separate um, survey that's been running at the moment, Mike, in the US, uh, and we we well, we'll be sharing that in the next, what, four weeks, maybe? Yeah, it's still open for people to take part. Yeah, check yeah. On the so, website. so great responses. Next slide, please. Okay, so it is a summary survey. Um, the full report's going to be available for those who, who completed the, um, the survey first, and then we will be releasing the, uh, the data thereafter. But you'll have to request that information if you want a full report. In, when's it going to be available, Mike? Maybe two or three weeks, maybe? Um, we're aiming for the end of next week. Um, that's yeah. our target. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to go through who completed the survey, the average salaries for each role, the impact of COVID-19, regional and gender variations, pay rises, benefits and perks, satisfaction, employer plans and industry outlook. Next slide, please. Okay, so who completed the survey? So, um, as we all know, it's very female dominated is the sector It was 74% female, 25% male, and 88.1% um, white or Caucasian um, who completed the survey. Next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so 
um, the way to describe your job role, uh, as always, uh, account management and writing are the, uh, the two standouts. There's a slight drop in account management, but not a huge amount and an increase in writing compared to previous years. But that gives you an idea of the type of people or the roles that people have completed the uh, survey. Next slide, please. So the work location, as we all know, Northwest, Southeast and London are the two, well, so the three places that most of the talent is, um, is based. So this is people, we asked the question, where, where, where is your UK work location? As you can see from London, at London at the bottom, there's a big decrease compared to the previous year. So whether that it means that people are gonna be work, are working from home more uh, instead of traveling into London, there's been an increase in the southeast and, and uh, definitely an increase in the northwest and the rest of the uh, UK is you know, small percentages. So uh, next slide, please, Mike. Okay. Yep. Let's start. Yeah, on. Please, yeah. There we go. It's there. Yeah. So, the average salaries. Um, this is always something that everyone's interested and you know interested in. Um, we see a massive increase, well, big increases on the writing side in the last 12 months. Um, we do have data available from the low to high end. So if you want to know that information, we can get that for you. But um, associate medical writer, there's been a 6.9% increase. Medical writer, 1.5 increase. Senior medical writer, 5.9% increase. Principal writer, 4.4. Scientific team lead, 8.8. Editorial director, 1. And scientific director, 9.5. On the editorial side, not a massive increase apart from the managing editor side. Um, we said a big, big increase there, which is um, eighteen percent, which is um, very, very unique. Um, on the client services, slight drop in the account exec and account management and account director um, in terms of average salaries, and also client services director just a slight drop. This is the data that we've been, you know, given. So. Um, It'd be interesting to see how that so those sort of numbers reflect in your in, in your company um, for you as a, as a candidate. So, and obviously on the management side, so director board level twenty percent increase, and uh, managing director CEO thirty one point two percent increase, which is massive increases. But obviously, um, um, I don't know how many people completed that. Mike, we can get that data, but yeah, it's interesting to see there's a massive increase at the top level. Next. Similar levels, there's a fair amount of people in management, obviously not as much as there are in writing and client services, but you know, there's a significant amount of people to get a good average for all. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good to see that on the, certainly on the writing side, there's, through the pandemic, um, there's been an increase in, in salaries. So that's, um, that's interesting to see. Okay, next slide. So impacts of COVID-19. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your current role and remuneration? So workload has decreased 0.39%, not much there. Workload has increased 45%, it's massive. Uh, no impact on my remuneration is 53, 54%. And I work from home 78%. I mean, I, I think a lot of people was working from home in the last 12 months anyway, purely because of the pandemic anyway. Um, salary reduced, very little. Um, been furloughed, very small amount. Um, but there is definitely the key key signs there is that workload has increased. And um, I think we talked about it earlier, Peter, is that um, the market is booming and there is a big demand for people at the moment, which is obviously putting pressure on, on the current staff to, to deliver. So um, that's something to be aware of, I think, moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your future career plans? None at all. That's really good, 47.9, 47%. Um, on hold, 7.37, more likely to move, 7%. More opportunities, 12%, not too bad. Working from home and delayed plans, 18.58%. Um, you know, one of the comments there is it's, it's has expanded opportunities for me as I can work from home. I can consider roles from further away than, than I would normally do in, a, in, in, in the pre-pandemic. We are finding that most companies are offering the flexible working and the working from home, whether that is working in terms of uh, integration and uh, bringing on new starters, that, that we, that's yet to be seen, but it seems that most companies are offering that flexibility. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, regional and gender variations. Next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so this is purely medical writers in the UK. Um, there still is a little bit of a north-south divide, uh, maybe what, 4,000 difference? Uh, not a huge amount, but still a, a divide. Um, there's definitely been an increase in the northwest in terms of salaries, uh, a slight increase in southeast, and certainly a bigger increase in London. So it will be interesting to see whether this is... Um, Again, you know, something that is reflected in your businesses. We, we are finding more companies are opening hubs in different areas of the country now to make it more flexible and to attract talent. So um, maybe we'll find, a, you know, an increase in some of the other areas like Cambridge, Oxford um, and the Northwest. Okay, next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so uh 2019 we were quite shocked at the 25.9 percent difference in male to female salaries then that came down to 9.1 percent which we thought was a great move but um, that seems to have gone back up to 23.3 percent which was quite surprising but i think the next slide will, will might highlight the reasons why that has been that might yeah okay so at the um the director senior management level it's 31.5 percent difference head of department 12.3 percent team leader 13.3 percent manager 18.3 percent but no people have got no management responsibilities of 14.1 percent is still a massive difference i don't know what um how people are managing that uh, and, and monitoring it but uh, uh, my opinion it needs to be addressed definitely Mike, what do you think? Yeah, it's concerning. I think we saw last year that there was a far lesser difference at the no level of responsibility, and that was quite encouraging. But then to see the difference, um, and I'm sure no employer intentionally pays their male and females differently. It just, you know, the data from our survey shows that the male people, um, males doing the survey are paid more than females at the same level. So, you know, it, that's, uh, that's what our data indicates. Uh, be interesting to see from any some of the big employers whether they actually do any um, uh, gender pay gap reporting to actually see what the figures are from their businesses. Maybe we can chat about that at the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Okay. So function. So um, writing there was a seven percent difference. Account management sixteen point seven percent, and general management thirty-eight point eight percent. So it, it's showing that. There are more, say, uh, more males at the senior level being paid, um, you know, a significant amount more. Um, and the account management client services, 16.7%, that is a big increase compared to what it was last year. So they are surprising, but that's, again, that's what the data presents. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so um, director, the split, 55% um, is female, 45% is male, Head of department, 72%, 28% uh, male, 75% team leader, 77% manager, 77% non. We thought this was quite interesting because I think last year was about, was it 70-30 or something very similar to that, Mike? So it's, it's showing that there's more females in, in, in the market, more, more females are going into the market than males. And that seems to be a trend. There could be a thought that actually more females actually did the survey um, because <laughs> cool. males are lazy we don't so no, potentially yeah potentially okay um next slide please mike okay so pay rises always an interesting one next one okay so do you expect to receive a pay rise in the next 12 months so um the average increase expected was 6.37 percent um 71 or 72 percent said yes absolutely going to be expecting a pay rise um 7.6 percent no i don't know 20 percent uh next slide mike yeah this just summarizes how that change has happened over the last three years um so i talk through this so back in 2018 yeah. people said they expected 5.2 they actually received 8.3 2019 people expected 6.9 actually received 8.7 Last year, it was expected 6.7 and got 9.8. Um, this year's survey, it was 6.4% um, expected. 
be interested to see then next year when we do the survey actually how much people actually did get but you can see the the received is slowly creeping up towards the 10 percent level of the actual pay increase but a few people got that through promotions and they mentioned that uh, but others just got it as a as a standard pay increase this year yeah okay next slide so benefits and perks okay so um so what benefits do you receive from your current employer so as you can see from the bottom working from home 90 percent uh, bonuses 76 percent that's an increase on last year flexible working 68 percent or 68 percent which is you know not surprising whatsoever and the rest of the other benefits maybe an increase in the um pension maybe and I think the rest of it's probably just normal, normal sort of levels. So we were, uh, obviously a lot of employers now are offering more flexible working and working from home and obviously increased bonuses. So, sorry, Mike, next slide, please. All right, so this was really interesting. So the contracted hours compared to last year has reduced. So it's 36 hours contracted compared to 37.2. And the actual hours worked is probably another five hours. So people are still working five hours more per week than what they're contracted to. Um, do they get paid for that? No, I think it's like 98% don't get paid for overtime. But I think in the market, that place that we work in, well, certainly in Medcoms, it is expected that people work harder and longer hours to, to hit deadlines. But how is that re? Really, um, uh, rewarded in, in in other ways, I think that'd be interesting to find that, that out. But uh, what's your thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, it's um, I, yeah. I mentioned when we we're running through this that it's amazing to me that um, you know people don't get paid over time when you know hopefully um, agencies can then charge that onto their clients if they're doing more work. Uh, but maybe that's a bit naive of me. Um, the, the actual working hours, people might question why it's gone down from 37.2 to 36. We did actually have quite a few more part-time people. So this does include part-time. Um, so you can see that the average number of hours have slightly reduced. Uh, but actually, you know, so the actual hours is five more than, and it was 4.9 last year. You can say people are doing more unpaid work than they were last year. And that reflects that question about how has COVID-19 impacted? I'm more busy. Um, and there's quite a few comments of people saying, actually, I'm just busier and it's more stressful in my work. Okay. But we'll see, we'll come on to satisfaction and see actually how that's impacted the satisfaction rate. Yeah, cool. So next slide, please. So favourite um, benefit or perk. Um, working from home was a massive one previous year. Now that's just gone down to like 61%, is it? Something like that? Yeah, 61 people mentioned it. Yeah, it's not a benefit any longer, is it? Everybody gets it, so. <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. And flexible working as well, that's gone up a yeah. bit more. So flexible working, be interesting to see how that works in terms of flexible working. Does that mean you can start a little bit later, finish yeah. earlier, or, or how that works in terms of how companies are structuring that? Do you finish early on a Friday? Do you, you know, have time off in lieu? So it'd be interesting to see how that works. Uh, bonus um, is right up there. Um, a lot more companies are offering bonuses now. And I think if you're working really, really hard, I think you should be um, given a decent bonus at the end of the year. So that's good. Uh, and I think the rest of them are pretty similar. Uh, obviously, dogs in the office and um, birthdays off and um, free lunch and breakfast and stuff like that. Four day weeks, they're all down the bottom there. So that just shows, I think, the difference in how companies work. Um, and how they get their employees in terms of uh, coming into the office and you're working from home. Cool. So what flexible working options does your current employer offer? So four day working week was a big headline a couple of years ago. I thought that was a really nice touch. Um, so 7.39% are only, you know, that, that getting sort of four day working week. No flexible working, very small amount. Occasional working, um, flexible working when required, 15, 16%. Flexible working hours in the office, 20%. Uh, one to two days per week working from home, 30.5%. But fully flexible working from home, 75%. I thought that was quite an, inter an interesting factor. 
Um, how are people structuring that? How are they, how are they, if you're going to be working from home, uh, you know, are you getting all the resources and all the um, equipment and everything else that you need to be able to work effectively from home? And how is that going to impact on mental health and, and interaction with the team? So that'd be interesting to see, but it sounds like obviously more people are, are offering that, uh, well, sorry, more companies are offering the fully flexible working from home. Next slide, please, Mike. So I talk through this. So um, satisfaction, Please, yeah. yeah. So we, this is just a scale from uh, 0 to 10 about how satisfied you are on your role. This is the overall figure. So 2019, it was 6.9. Last year, it was 7. Uh, this year, 7.1. So actually, even with COVID, even with people working harder, satisfaction has actually gone up slightly. Uh, and if you look at the satisfaction by role, um, client services was the one that really was falling behind in 2019. It looks like you know, satisfaction has been increasing slowly in that area. It's still not as satisfied as writers. And of course, the general management look like they're the most satisfied. Um, but um, th that's just an interesting trend to see satisfaction despite the increased working. Satisfaction has slightly increased. We also looked at the um, satisfaction by seniority. Um, this is interesting that the um, so at no management level uh, satisfaction 7.2. Originally, when we did it the first year, team leaders were the most stressed, um, but actually they're not far behind now. Managing not far. one that sticks out, obviously directors and heads, you know, they're the most satisfied, 7.8. Um, somebody might suggest that, well, given the amount they're paid, um, then maybe that's why they're satisfied. But uh, Obviously, being direct in the heads has been quite challenging this year, but the way the market's picked up, I imagine they're getting more satisfaction from that. Any thoughts, Dan? No, I agree. I think I think everyone, everyone we speak to loves the industry. I mean, the industry's been booming through the COVID situation. I know other people in, in other recruitment marketplaces and they've really struggled. So um, it still remains a, a booming marketplace and um, everyone enjoys working in it. And we are making a big difference, especially in the COVID situation. I think people are working in a very good industry. Um, so yeah, I'd agree. I think um, most people love it. Yes, they might be worked hard. <laughs> they might have to work a little bit longer, but in general, absolutely. It's a good, good market to be in. And yeah, leaving on from satisfaction is then the question about um, when you're gonna be making your next career move. I think that's next, there you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So as a recruiter, <laughs> uh, this is telling me that not many people are looking to move uh, soon. So it sounds like people are being very stable in, in terms of the working environment, uh, which is good, I suppose. Um, but people are, it sounds like, and we found this as well, there's not much movement in the marketplace. There's a big demand for people, but there's not much movement. It's, people seem to be quite settled. So quite low numbers there compared to it was like 10% um, last year and it's only 5.73% people are going to move in the next six months, which is a massive drop. Uh, six to 12 months is not, not too much of a difference. And again, one to two years, that's dropped. Two to three years, that's dropped. More than three years, that's increased. So that's telling me that people are quite, quite stable where they are at the moment and there's no real rush to move. Um, and I think we talked about it as well, Peter, is that what, what are the push and pull factors at the moment? What, what can companies offer that, you know, flexibility and working from home was a key thing. Everybody's doing that now. So what, what are the main reasons for people to move um, the projects and the work and the, the business and the, the reputation of the company? Yeah, all these sort of factors are there. So it'd be interesting to find out the reason why people would move and why they, why they want to make the next um, career change. So, um, but it sounds like it's very stable at the moment. Freelance. Okay. So there's 14% of people who did our survey were a freelance. Um, so these are the figures that they came up with there, uh, what their daily uh, rate is. Yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to find out what people think about this as well. Uh, it looks about right for, for what we've uh, experienced in terms of freelance, but the IR35 situation has mm, maybe impacted a few people. So it'd be nice to see what, it'd be interesting to see what it looks like in the next sort of six to 12 months, whether that's impacted. Um, we're finding, I think, Peter, you said as well, didn't you? Uh, the larger companies are yeah, probably, the IR35 the is affected them big time um, in terms of employing people. 
But it certainly had an impact. I, I don't think we can deny it's had an impact. It's just difficult to know quite what the impact is. And it's quite individual to a company and a freelance in terms of how the package has, has been impacted by what the systems are now to deal with IR35. So I think it's quite complicated to, to look at. Um, but there's no doubt there's been an impact. Yeah, massive impact. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so in the oops, hello. Um, yeah, what's happened to this one? Hold on, my technical issue. Okay, some okay. There's a bit of auto build on this one. I'm trying to take it up. Yeah, a few times. Yeah. So um, as always, and we we know this. This is in the UK and the US. The demand for talent is massive at the moment. We're talking to hire more new employees over the last 12 months. Sorry, more than the last 12 months, 62.5%. That's massive. Everybody seems to be recruiting at the moment. Everybody. Um, business is good by the sounds of it. So um, are people, are people, is, you know, is there an issue with the marketplace in terms of talent? Because if, you, if everybody's trying to recruit as many people as possible, then where's the throughput? Well, you know, we need more talent in the marketplace. Are people training and uh, attracting uh, trainees and developing new people? Or are they just trying to take, um, you know, people from other companies? But my opinion is that there's not enough talent in the marketplace at the moment to, 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 um, to um, satisfy demand. I agree, Dan. Yeah. Next one is quite interesting because it just backs that up. Um, so this question about industry outlook, we asked anybody who was responsible for hiring people what their view was and how COVID has impacted their business from a, an overall business point of view. Um, and this was the, the overall, the, the mentions of these different impacts, this was a free tax answer. So 32 people were saying revenue growth, 28 busier, 26 increased virtual work and you mentioned actually having a real recruitment challenge so that's not what you're saying Dan people are busy but they can't recruit the people uh, only a small number actually say they've lost business um, so that indicates that positive shift in the market um, this is just a quote that somebody put in we've got more business we can service and turning some down um, there's another one that said increased volume of work we can't keep up with, with recruitment so everybody's overworked so that's just two little snapshots, but uh, indicates it's busy and there's growth, um, but there's increasing pressure on people who are working within a business. Sorry, Dan, I'll next your slide. No, no, I agree. I agree. I think um, uh, most companies are trying to trying to get talent on board at the moment and trying to work the balance between um, workload and, uh, and and getting talent on board. But yeah, I mean that's not surprising at all. Cool. So that ends the, um, the information we've got in this snapshot um, of the survey. Um, as Dan said earlier, we're going to put together a full report that's available to everybody that did the survey um, and which will be going out hopefully by the end of next week. Um, there's a bit of data crunching, as you can imagine, but there's other things about what you like and dislike about the job, what's important when looking for a new job. Um, and how you look for new roles and just views of future trends of medcoms uh, will all be in the report. Right. So I think we we're going to go on to Q and A. Okay, great. Great, thanks very much, guys. Um, can we close those slides? Um, and can I start in the way that I've probably, I've probably started this sort of conversation each of the last four years in the same sort of way. But I do think it's important. Um, you know, there should be health warnings stamped on, on online surveys. I think we should all be realistic and sensible about that. Um, so, so be careful when we look at the individual figures. Um, I think my own interest in this sort of data is that there's not a lot, if anything else, out there publicly available. So within the sort of healthcare or within medcoms um, and that's what excites me because if it even if the data you sit there and go I don't believe that at least it makes you think about it and make you talk about it and within the company for instance you can start to think about these issues um, I think that's interesting so uh, that's why I support it that's why I'm keen to see it happen but there's a but there's a health warning over it okay um, and um, and I will just ask the audience I mean one of the again 
I suppose, following the same sort of thought. The, the audience that's watching us today, please, you know, let us know your comments and thoughts and um, how you're reacting to it and any questions you've got. We've got some questions that have come in um, and I'd love to have some more questions as we spend the next quarter of an hour or so um, having a chat about this. Um, there's several questions that have come in sort of about the statistics side of it, the numbers side of it. So I think we probably just sort accepting my comment which is be careful um i think we just need to clarify maybe a couple of things nick came in early on um just to be clear we've we've sort of compared 2021 with 2020 was that uk only data that we were comparing i think we were because i know there's more data you've got but i think you've pulled out the uk data and the comparisons are uk only um yes. Uh, there's some comments about how to get down to more depth in terms of uh, job roles and so on. I suppose, again, the point is you are producing a full report and there is more data. So another point that we should make is this is the summary data. There's more that's available and they should contact you for more information. Um, a couple of people, so let, but let's, well, I'm going to ask the first question, actually. I'm going to ask my question this way, um, and, and, and maybe to Mike, sort of to begin with, from your point of view, but then Dan, from the sort of point of view you said, was there anything, well, I think you've sort of touched on it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what surprised you, if anything? Was there anything that jumped out at you? And you went, oh, that was unexpected. Mike, from a, from a numbers point of view, did you see anything? Not, I mean, the growth in the management salaries was the one that stands out for me from a statistical perspective. Sorry, I've got a train going past, if you might hear that. Um, the, what was quite nice actually to see when we you know, totaled up all the salaries and averaged them actually was very, very similar. Um, so it backs up the data from previous years. Um, but for me, it was that the big changes were the growth in management salaries and then that seismic change if you remember the question about are you going to hire more or less people when you first did it it was you know, you know five times as many companies going to hire more than less last year it was actually about level because people were a bit unsure but this year actually it's about nine times more businesses are looking to hire more people than less people and that is just you know underlines the uh, you know the, the busyness within the marketplace Okay, and, and Dan, the same sort of question, but, you know, those are the key points. In some ways, those are key points. I mean, this is a busy business. You've said that, you know, this is a business that's boomed in the last year. Lots of people recruiting, countered by lots of people probably going, well, I'm going to stay where I am for a while um, and see what happens. Um, we need more people in this business. But what, yes or no? And what sort of surprised you, if anything, about the survey? I, I agree. All our clients are saying we're... we're, we're you know, where are the candidates? Why, why can't you find people for us? You know, what, what, you know what, what, what's the issue? Because everybody's trying to recruit at the moment. But I think a lot of companies are looking after the staff. So there's not much movement. But I still say this, and I said this in the last survey and the survey before, we need more people coming in into the industry. We need more people feeding through. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, a you know, a, a war on talent. And it's going to end up just going around in circles. Um, so I think definitely need more people coming into the industry. I know some of the bigger companies have like um, like um, training plans and and, and uh, you know um, development plans for, for, for people coming in, especially at training writer level. Um, but um, my concern is that there's a lot of people working really really hard, you know, longer hours, and maybe are they getting rewarded appropriately? That's my concern. And um, bonuses is a great way. Salaries, yeah, it's there, thereabouts. Most companies are quite competitive. There's not really a massive difference, um, but it's how you reward your staff, how you give them back something uh, for all the effort that they put in. But, you know, in a nutshell, we need more people in the, in the industry, simple as that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I was talking to somebody yesterday um, who was uh, had a very strong opinion um, on the fact that, um, with, which is backed up entirely by your figures, that there's salary inflation. Yeah. Um, and some of the some job levels, the salaries are jumping dramatically. And we're working in an agency environment where the clients are squeezing back, as it were. Um, and you know they, 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 there's got to be a balance in there sort of thing and and yes people are in demand and yes they can get more money however there's a business model there that could get disrupted i just wonder whether you have a view on that dan and what you're seeing across yeah, the business uh, you know what a, a, a classic example of that would be a scientific director one company exactly. offered a certain amount of money another company offered a certain amount of money and there was like a ten thousand pound difference Exactly. Which, in fact, the example I got yesterday was even bigger than that. And it's sort of like the, 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 the balance doesn't work. So is there a is there a problem in there? 
Uh, I suppose if you, you make hay while you can. If you want talent, then maybe you, you have to pay a little bit more. But I don't think people move just purely for money. I think they move for everything else, like the, the, the company, the culture, the flexibility, the, you know, how they're, they're treated, uh, uh, you know, as an employee. There's lots of other things that I think people, you know, there's, it's not just about the money. It's never always about the money. Money makes a difference. I mean, if you, if you, you know, if you get offered 10,000 pound more to join one company over another company, yeah, it's, it can be a bit of a no brainer, but I still think that that is, that's not the way forward. Um, just throwing money at it. I think it's, um, there's more to, uh, there's more to that sector that, you know, people who work in our sector want to make a difference. Um, but I, as I say, I'm, I'm more intrigued about the, you know, what it does to the business model in an agency. If you're being squashed at one end and the costs are rising, you know, there's a problem that's, that's at least looming in the, on the horizon well, sort well, of thing. If I, if, I, if I talk about the US market, the US, the amount of money companies that were earning in the US in terms of the, like, you know, the billings and stuff like that is, is, is phenomenal. The demand is massive. So they pay really, really good, good salaries. I, I think in the UK, the demand is that definitely there, but there's not enough talent. And um, I just think that maybe it'd be interesting to find someone else's opinion on this because I've, I've got to be careful what I say in terms of that. Okay. <laughs> and, and audience members, do please, even if you just, you know, just add some comments into the boxes because it's very useful to pick up on it. Um, just Let's just face up. There's been several comments coming about the gender pay balance. Let's just face that one up because I, I, I always just go, let's be very, very careful with this because it doesn't need very many people at the top, for instance, who happen to be male to happen to have, you know, paid someone to skew the details. Um, and I would be, you know, and it is a female, I mean, the comment was in such a female dominated industry, how does that, how do you get to that sort of stage? The numbers are, you know, you gotta be very, very careful with the numbers. But just on that point, again, um, I mean, from a numbers point of view, Mike, a couple of questions came in in terms of, um, you know, is this because more women are working part-time for instance, and is that skewing the figures? Have you got just a little bit of context on what those numbers might or might not mean before we all get upset about the fact that it looks like the blokes are paying themselves all the money? You're on mic. You're on. You're on mute. Mute, uh, Mike. Sorry, I had another train go past. Um, yeah, all the salaries. Um, the point about part time. All the part time salaries were recalculated to full time equivalents. Um, so we didn't um, include any part time salaries when we didn't know what the part time rate was. So we asked people to put down their part time hours. Somebody put four days a week. We then re multiplied it up their salary to a full time equivalent. Or some people put what their FTE was. So wherever possible, we made sure it was FTE that we used. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the pay gap, you're right, Peter. I don't think any company intentionally pays people doing the exact same job a different amount if they're female or male. What did worry me, though, and concern me, I thought about, yeah, there have been slightly more males at a higher level being paid more. That was correct. But at every level, there is still a, a gap between, you know, the average female salary as a, um, you know, a head of department is still less than the average male salary as the head of department. Um, and it, it looks like it's, you know, there's no reason for it, but whether you know, in other industries, they've done some research, say, well, well, men will push themselves to have more responsibility and have, you know, to, to be in the bigger jobs with, um, you know, with more people working or work for bigger agencies. I don't know if that's true in this sector because we were unable to get that data from all the figures. Um, but you know, it's just one of those worrying statistics. You're thinking there's without examining everything. Um, and I don't know if you know, Peter, from some of the, the bigger agencies, do they, have they done gender pay gap reporting? Um, and do they actually have those information? Well, I understand some do, although I don't see it. So, uh, you know, but um, it would be interesting you know, and again, part of the point of an exercise like this is to make agencies, for instance, think about it. And if they do think about their own data and so on, we can only report the data we're getting. And that's an important point. We just have to keep sort of uh, emphasizing here. Um, but in terms of, I mean, we've the flexible working, and, and again, some of this is a bit confused because of the changing times we're living in, as far as I'm concerned. You know, someone uh, commented earlier on, it's interesting that work from home is still classed as a benefit. I'm sure lots of people don't see it as a benefit anymore. And that's actually quite an interesting change in itself. Um, again, thinking back to the conversation I was having uh, yesterday, um, flexible working, huge, 
Um, you know, and, and the person I was talking to was saying, there's no problem with flexible working. So long as they get the work done, I'm more than happy about that. The problem that th that, that director was seeing was that more and more people were going part time and there were protected time. So from a management point of view, it was actually getting difficult because you had to remember who wasn't working on a Friday or a Wednesday afternoon or a this or a that or the other. Um, whereas she was quite happy going, look, if it's a full time person, they can work when they want. Having said that, I still see practical problems with that. Um, but do you, just out of interest, Dan, from, a, from the marketplace point of view, um, do you see a lot more part-time roles being offered? And I mean, yeah. genuinely part-time roles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, more people are asking for it and they want it in the contracts as well. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, whether it's four days, uh, I think four days, three days sometimes, but generally four days is uh, what people ask for. Um, uh, but more people are asking for it to be put in the contract. So whether that right. is where, where they're working at the moment, whether the the company can turn that around and say you can provide five days a week or whatever. But yeah, so people want to know exactly what the flexible working looks like and how is it going to be contracted and how is it going to be put put into the uh, okay. Contract. And that, on that point, which is a question I personally have a, a great deal of interest in, as it were, partly because nobody will really talk to me very much about it. Uh, but what's your experience with contracts? So we've got people maybe taking on new jobs where you're saying that they're, they're asking for more detail in the contract in terms of flexible working. Lots of people in the business being required to work more flexibly. Just out of interest, are agencies, are companies renewing contracts, you know, for people that are already working with them? And, and and how what does that mean or or are people simply just putting up with the old contract but working in a very different way and doesn't that cause a problem you, you, you see what i'm getting yeah, at? yeah yeah I, I i don't see many people having the contracts changed um but when they move they they do get the change in the contract so maybe staying where you are um you know you might need to have a chat with your, your employer because there's a legal route that you need to go through if you want to request reduced hours anyway so i mean if you want to do that with your employer then ask you know ask for it and then you, they, they can consider that but um, no they definitely is there's certainly not changes in contracts not many okay so not not many and, and again i do know somebody who is so so i shouldn't say we, we need to be careful with the generalizations here but it does strike me that you know working at home is a very different scenario to working in an office contractually um with with you know ramifications implications for the contracts and the responsibilities and so on um we're now you know this time last year we were weeks into a whole new way of working now people are settling into a very different way of working and that does require i think different arrangements being made but it's interesting that people aren't doing that um or not very many people um i'm just having a look at a couple of, of questions here there's some um some questions on the on the flexible uh, working song which we're sort of talking a little bit about um sorry that might be a bit bit more specific um somebody's um can't negotiate. okay what do you think of the, um do you say okay so I and mean, it was an interesting point um you made in your, your slide where there's it seemed like there was a brain drain from london sort of thing but the question was about where you're working isn't it where, not where your office is so the expectation is that in, in many instances people were going well i'm now not commuting to London, I'm sitting here in Berkshire, so I'm out of London sort of thing. Um, again, just as a general point, do you, uh, presumably that's just going to increase um, the more flexible working, the spread around the country. Um, do you see then, what's your take on the hybrid model type conversation? You know, if you're an agency based in London, you're, people aren't commuting, they're all based out in wherever. Are you starting to are you are you seeing people starting to set up little hubs and, and arrangements and things to allow people some sort of hybrid type working so they're not just working at home or not or what i don't know i think it's a very confused situation what's your what's your take on it dan um uh, there's some companies who want to get people back in the office whether that's three days four days five days lots of people want to do that uh, just to get the interaction of the team. I mean, it's a, it is a sector where you need to be working as a team. So you have to have that office, you have to have that interaction. Um, so I think it's a balance. I, I think companies are still trying to test the water with it at the moment. I really do. Uh, traditionally, you know, Monday and Friday working from home in the office, Tuesday to Thursday is, is common. Sometimes it's like four days, sometimes it's something else. Um, but you have to offer that flexibility. If you don't, then you're going to struggle to keep staff and also attract staff I think at the moment I do I do paint this picture which I find intriguing that you know a, a good writer say sitting at their desk 
writing in a company, you know, but might have an off day. Let's just let's follow that scenario where they're just a bit hacked off. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, and in the old days, you'd go, oh, but you'd go and have a drink and you'd settle down because actually you couldn't move that easily. Whereas now you're sitting there going, I don't have to necessarily move an inch, you know, from my desk and I could be employed by somebody else. So that, it's, you know, that, that throws an interesting dynamic in, you know, into the, into well, the thought yeah, process. Think about it, Peter. If, you, if you've got an hour commute into London um, five days a week and now you don't have to commute an hour into London, the work-life balance is amazing. The difference that, I, that, that those two hours make a massive difference to your work-life balance. I think it's great. But you have well, on to that on that point, we have to be a little bit careful because there are there are people, and I've done the, I've had this conversation and run the surveys. You know, there are there are people who go, it's terrible because I liked that commute. <laughs> it was the only time in the day that I had a bit of peace and quiet. So, so it's it's horses for courses and so on. But the yeah. fact that someone could effectively just sit there and go, I no longer have to think about where the company is based because everyone's offering flexible working and I don't have to move from my desk and I could get a new job to come back to the point you were sort of making you know earlier on what do employers have to do to hang on to their staff or what can they do to throw in to attract staff is it I, I know we talked around the cash thing but at the end of the day you've got flexible working you've got you know we're sending you little cards and bottles and making being nice we've got but you know if you sit there and just go I want more cash you know what I think, Peter? Okay. And then you've got the salary yeah. inflation thing, which is a real yeah. problem. The working environment is the, is the culture. I think that's a real big factor. It's who you're working with, what your boss is like, and how you interact with other staff. It's, that's a key thing at the moment. Okay, okay. Go on, Mike, the, go on. Uh, in the full report, we do ask the question, um, what is important to you when looking for a new job? So from a candidate perspective, what actually attracts them? And we also ask them what they like and what they dislike about their current job. So anybody looking for, if they've got retention issues, if they look to attract people, yeah, really making sure they understand what's going to attract people into their company, what are candidates looking for at the moment? You know, that's the key thing on any um, you know, recruitment campaign. You've got to work out what actually is going to attract candidates in, what are they looking for, what is very interesting. But also make sure that your business can back that up I've done a lot of work with companies in the past. Oh, yeah, well, we do this, do this, do this. But you actually ask the current staff and it's a different picture. You know, they haven't got that wonderful culture and they haven't got this. You think you've got to be true. And a lot of some campaigns I did actually, what's bad about working here? You, you, this is, you know, you've got to be truthful. You've got to be clear about your employer value proposition and your employer brand when you're going out there and doing any recruitment campaign. Otherwise, you're just giving yourself a retention problem and you're creating, you're going to recruit recruit lots of can or interview lots of candidates they go actually this isn't what it looks yeah. like yeah. so you just yeah. got to make yeah. sure you yeah. understand your EVP you understand why people love working for you uh, and get that across okay 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 look guys we've, we've run over time again so I ought to wrap it up um um but it's been really really interesting and, and I, I will repeat the fact that I think that what we're doing is raising issues to be thought about rather than necessarily giving the exact number of, 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 of any one of these answers um Dan have you got a, a, but it's also I mean Mike an important point to end on in terms of there is a full report coming and people can contact you um and they should do to get more data Dan have you got a final comment yeah, I'd say uh, there's so much data that we've got. I mean, uh, and Mike, God bless you, trying to crunch that, that th those numbers. But there's so much, so much data. It, it's really good. Seven, 720 people in the UK, and we've got so much data. So if anybody wants a particular bit of information or, you know, salary ranges or you know, certain information, then, then let us know. Obviously, the report goes to the people who completed the survey first. So that's definitely, uh, but it should be available, you know, further down the line. But if you request certain information, I'm more than happy to uh, share it. Um, okay. Okay. Some really good data, really good data. Good. OK. And once again, applaud you for, for doing it, because I just think publicly we need data like this to at least have the conversations around. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, those of you in the audience today, don't rush away if you don't need to. We can, um, uh, we can uh, keep talking for 10 minutes or so. Um, there's a couple of questions we can cover off here. Um, but for the purpose of the recording, I'm going to wrap it up now and say thank you very much to the speakers, uh, panellists, Dan and Mike, both of whom are very happy to hear from you. LinkedIn is an easy way to do it. Um, Dan's got his um, contact details up there now. And importantly, if you want more information about this data, then please do follow up um, and get that more, uh, more um, granular data. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to wrap up at the moment. I'm going to just ask everyone to give us a wave and stop the recording and um, 
yeah, thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye.